This next lecture is going to be a very special experience for you. This is a lecture that Carl Taylor made several years before his death. You've heard me mention Carl from time to time already at various points in this course, and you'll be hearing more about him as we go forward as well. The lecture that you'll be hearing now, Carl recorded several years before his death as the introductory lecture in a course that is on the website on the open courseware that we have here at Johns Hopkins called Case Studies in Primary Health Care. But the title of this lecture is called Roots of Primary Health Care, The Path Towards Almata. And you'll hear some similarities in what Carl is talking about to what I've already presented to you, but it's slightly different. There'll be some different nuances and different emphases, and I think it'll be great for you to hear uh, these ideas as Carl himself presented them to his students. Enjoy. Hello, this is Carl Taylor. I'm here talking for a course that I've been teaching now for several years at Johns Hopkins called Case Studies in Primary Health Care. The course started about 1987 when I came back from China where I had been UNICEF representative and the students asked that I start a course to tell what uh, we learned when working for UNICEF in China. And as I always said, it was a great opportunity to do that, to be responsible for the whole China program at a time when um, I'd been teaching international health, and now I had a chance to actually do it. And this topic of that we're opening with, what is primary health care, grows out of the involvement that we had had during the 1970s to actually work together with the people in WHO and UNICEF for the World Conference on Primary Health Care. And I was one of the two consultants who drafted the basic documents for the alma Ata Conference. And so this topic of what is primary health care is what I've spent a lot of time thinking about. The historical overview is important because People have used different labels for different parts of the process. Um, U.S. clinicians just call it primary care because they are dealing with the individual focus and the first contact that patients and health care providers have is their focus. During the early days of this field as it developed, and we'll mention this later, particularly as a result of the work of CARC in South Africa, there was a common term used in public health in the United States, which is community-oriented primary care, COPC. And this is the name that's been a applied to a lot of what's been done in the U.S. and Israel because when Kark left South Africa because apartheid became too difficult for them to cope with, he moved to Israel and started it there, and other members of his team then moved to the U.S. Kark was the leader who developed the whole idea of primary health care as it was first applied in South Africa. Then the Almata label was what we called the concept of primary health care at Almata Conference. We first defined it called comprehensive primary health care. Then after 1984, there was a change 
and they called it selective primary health care because they said that the donors were not willing to wait in order to do the comprehensive process and they wanted to be very selective. And that was a period of very great confrontation between the two perceptions. And then recently we've been focused mainly on community-based primary health care, which is the terminology that's used now by the Action Group, which meets each year at the American Public Health Association annual conference. And they are very actively building on this history in order to adapt it to the current situation around the world. Seed scale is the terminology that we use for a new approach to doing primary care for the whole social development activity rather than just for health. And here we talk about integrated community-based social development. This is particularly sponsored by a NGO called Future Generations that I've been working with for the past uh, 10 or 15 years. Looking at the broad sweep of history, there are ancient systems of health care that still persist, particularly in China and India. There used to be a very important tradition in Greece with Hippocrates and the leaders who then essentially formulated the European approaches to health care. All religions had a major component of um, health care built into their religious practices at the time when we didn't have scientific understanding, and that was particularly in the hands of different kinds of shamans. And I've always been interested in the most community-based primary health care, which was in Babylon because in a public square there, if somebody was sick, they put him in a bed and took him to the square, and anybody that came by was supposed to stop and give advice on what he could do to improve health care, and that is something that we certainly don't do anymore. It used to be very common. So the original exchanges in international health has very amazing similarities between systems around the world. There are a lot of countries that believe in hot and cold foods, which means that people are not, the foods are not considered hot or cold either because of temperature or pepper, but they are hot and cold because of what they do to the body. They produce this kind of very specific effect that people talk about. Then there are all the spirits that were considered so important in causing ill health. And then the humors that the Greeks talked about are very similar to what we find in the Ayurvedic system in India. And the miasmas that were considered so important in Europe and then all the healing practices that spread around the world. So most of the early systems of healthcare focused on prevention and on integrated services rather than what we see now. And in the pre-scientific period, it was the syncretism was the process of exchange. Any new idea that came along that people thought worked would be shared, and there was a worldwide sharing this was all based on the most simplistic understanding of causes, which has changed, of course. And Hippocrates was important not only because he was an important leader in Greece, but he was the one who started separating medicine from public health because he recognized the geographic patterns that certain diseases had. 
And in the Indian and Chinese systems particularly, there were certain classics that are still used in the training programs that are done in the Ayurvedic system in India. The Charaka, Susrata, Vagbhata are basic texts which are still being used. And then with independence, the Chopra Commission in the new government in India was formed specifically to bring back the old Ayurvedic systems. And so they produced legal recognition, but they've had a losing battle with the commercial success of Western doctors and the pharmaceutical industry that has taken over. And so there was research on ancient herbs. The Indian National Institutes were formed to go back to study whether there was a, anything that was in the ancient herbs that would lead to better health. And there are a few successes, such as the Raofia drugs for hypertension came out of Indian Himalayan herbs. And so now we see piracy in, around the world of the commercial companies going out and tapping into all of this accumulated knowledge and then taking the medicines away from the countries in a way that means that the country does not get any profit from it. And this results now in the commercial eradication of plants when production becomes profitable for the drug companies and they lead to the destruction of the ecosystems where these plants are growing. And in China, again, there's a similar pattern that has been very evident, and it goes back to what is called the Yellow Emperor's Classic. There's been a great effort, particularly in China, to integrate the traditional systems with modern medicine. The modern origins of primary health care go back to Virchow in Germany, who was a great pathologist, but he developed the general idea of social medicine. And then post-World War I, in England, there was a report called the Dawson Report that led to the Peckham Health Center and then a network of health centers. In the U.S. then, there were social work and health centers. But the first paradigm of an international development of what we now call modern primary health care goes back to a place, Dingxian, which is a district in China about 200 kilometers south of Beijing, where there was the first published demonstration of the concept that we're still learning how to do and to get accepted in the modern health care. The important thing about the Stingshan process was that even though it started in the late 1940s, it became very important in the 1950s as Mao and the Communist Revolution took over China. And this project became the basis for the barefoot doctor system, which then was serving mainly through the 1960s and 1970s, a quarter of the world's population with the most equitable system of health care that's yet been devised. But in the 1980s, that collapsed with Deng Xiaoping and the economic reforms in the post-Mao period, so that now China has as severe an inequity as the United States, which is very sad to see. The barefoot doctor system was designed specifically to have a person at community level who was trained to provide health care. And that came out of the Dingxian project and then was picked up by Mao and the communist government as a national program that proved very effective. 
And so now we turn to the second and third generation projects, which from the late 1930s to the 1950s, people followed the Dingxian model, which had been actually done and promoted by John B. Grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, and then C.C. Chen and Jimmy Yen from China. Next generation of projects from that beginning was with Heydrich in Indonesia, Stampar in Croatia, Eloesa in Chile, and then in China, and other people who took those ideas and then implemented projects. There was a major historical contribution of the Rockefeller Foundation who developed centers in about 12 or 15 countries around the world. And particularly important were the centers that were established in Sri Lanka and Kerala, which were carried on and very successful as a result of that start back in the 1950s and became the basis of formal health systems that were studied in the 1970s and 80s, where we were asking the question, how do these places develop the lowest cost type of health care, which proved so effective? Then in the late 1950s, Cork in South Africa started the Polela, health project that became the first basis for this kind of work in Africa. Then in 1960s and 70s, we had the Naringwal project that we'll be talking about in this course. There was Fendel's work in Kenya. Geiger brought the work that Clark had done at Polela to the U.S., and it became the basis of the OEO under Johnson a project system that is still present in the U.S. And then the Arolis in Jumcade will started a project that we'll also be talking about. And then in the 1970s, we had the Watershed Conference, the World Conference on Primary Health Care at Alma Ata. Let me just turn now to something that people don't usually talk about very much, which is the systems of traditional practitioners, which is true around the world. We shouldn't think that there are countries that didn't have health care when we bring in modern health care, because every country had some system for taking care of sick people and health patterns that controlled behavior. And so now we see a constant dilemma in developing countries of the competition that result with traditional practitioners and modern practitioners, who then label them as quacks. And so we have many anecdotes of the spontaneous syncretism that happens today when these quacks see medicines that are being sold in pharmacies, they use them and they move into just having, adding them to their own practices. And so we see this use of Western drugs, which compared to ancient practices often do work better, they just use them. And so there were many studies in the 1950s and 60s and 70s about these traditional practitioners, and particularly about traditional birth attendants, which led to efforts to integrate them and absorb them into the formal health system. But these were never very successful, and there's still major ambiguities about what happens and why in these efforts to integrate and why so often they end up with a competition and not cooperation. So we have the question now, what is the place in community-based primary health care of these traditional practitioners in the poorest and most remote areas? And here we are now in public health trying to attract people to 
work internationally. And one of the things that we keep asking, how can we make the routine work that is so necessary in areas of great need seem interesting? And one of my practices has been to always look as you get into an international situation where there is a combination of traditional practice and modern effort, always look for the natural experiment. And what you look for is be looking at people rather than just at the numbers that we collect in our statistical studies. We really do miss the good old days of the infectious epidemics because when you had an epidemic, you had to pay attention to prevention and you had to pay attention to causation and then prevention was built on the understanding of what the causes really were and then you could aggressively introduce the interventions. One of my old friends in Boston was Pat Rubenstein, who was the chief Massachusetts epidemiologist. And he had a lecture in which he gave to medical students, which was based on question, when do I get up out of my chair? When do I need to do a personal investigation? Is it time for shoe leather epidemiology when you go out and see what's really going on? And that's when you can really begin to make a difference in terms of adapting whatever the standard methods are to the reality of the local situation. And so the question we're always asking, what can I do to make a difference and how? We're going to be talking about these issues a little more because in one of the subsequent lectures, we'll go into the issue of how can you actually prepare doctors in medical education in developing countries who will actually go and work in the villages.